Thank you so much for joining us today and to discuss providing good jobs um, and what that means and how it leads to productive workplaces. So first I wanna say Prosperity Now, uh, Pacific Community Ventures, and families and worker funds have all come together to create an anchor partnership and collaborate on using and thinking of small businesses as a pathway and strategy to increase good job creation. Um, and what we mean by good jobs is that it provides opportunities for economic mobility, economic stability, and worker voice to ensure that folks are heard. And what we do at Prosperity Now is to support systems change and support racial equity and wealth development for communities that are in need. And so with our aligned values, principles, specifically on this opportunity to, to create good and quality jobs, we wanna empower small business owners, economic development organizations, economic support organizations that provide um, either workforce development, TA, or any other type of service to contribute to this in a meaningful way through supporting the small business owners in your network um, and providing an opportunity for them to become leaders and to show themselves as leaders in their community by uh, creating opportunities to employ them, employ the folks in their communities, to provide future opportunities for financial growth, financial development. And all of this is a reinforcing and reinforcement um, tool for the business owners because it's a win-win situation for both the employees and the employers. So we have invited a couple folks to talk about this today with you. Um, and you can gather your perspective on how this might apply to the current work you're doing. So I'd like to introduce Olivia Harp, who is our network and program manager at Prosperity Now, and Sadie Schaefer, who is a CEO founder and bred seriously, hire like a badass, um, owner and consultant who've gone to do some of this work and apply it. And so we'd like to invite you to listen uh, to their perspective and what they have to say. So I'll go ahead and pass the mic. Thank you guys so much. And thank you, Joelle. Um, really appreciate you getting us together for this important conversation today. Um, I love this work. I love the work that Prosperity Now and others like Sadie um, and another organization that we're going to name drop a lot throughout this conversation are doing in the good jobs practice realm. Um, so I am going to just slightly introduce myself and then I'll pass things over to Sadie. Um, Sadie and I are really familiar with each other. So this will be a really cool, calm, casual conversation, um, kind of like a lunch and chat. So feel free to settle in, get relaxed, um, interact with us in the comments. And, um, we hope that you get a lot out of today's discussion. So like Joel said, my name is Olivia Harp and I'm the program manager for network building at Prosperity Now. Um, I do a lot with our uh, Gates Good Jobs initiative and um, I get to meet really cool people like Sadie and have conversations like this on LinkedIn. So um, I'll pass things over to Sadie who will introduce herself and then um, you'll get to learn a lot more about her um, as we keep going throughout today's conversation. Thanks, Olivia. And thanks, Joelle. I'm excited to be here. I love talking about all things good jobs. You can't see with the overall straps, but I'm wearing my Fund Good Jobs t-shirt from ICA. Um, so I thought I'd be on brand for today. So I'm Sadie mm -hmm. Sheffer. I am a two-time CEO and founder. So my first business started in 2011. It's called Bread Seriously. It's a gluten-free sourdough bread company based in Oakland, and we have about 17 amazing employees. Um, and my second business is a digital course that teaches small business owners how to hire employees. And it's a reliable, repeatable hiring method and process that helps people find great talent and then retain them long-term. Um, and so that one's called Hire like a badass. And I also do uh, consulting around good jobs and hiring. So it's been, it's been a really good time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. I can tell it's been a really big time by the big smile on your face. Um, <laughs> I will try to refrain from going down the, like my sweet tooth and carbs rabbit hole with you. Um, but I love, love, love your business. I'm certain that you uh, enjoy um, 
enjoy owning it, enjoy operating it, and just enjoy like the, the goods, right? That come from, um, from a business life. <laughs> Definite perk, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I won't go down the rabbit hole because we're here to talk about good jobs. Um, and I think a lot of times whenever we talk about entrepreneurship and small businesses, um, we understand the importance of good jobs, but good jobs aren't necessarily um, top of mind, right, for a lot of business owners. Um, I think a lot of business owners are just mainly focused on surviving and then thriving, right? Um, but thriving and good jobs really go hand in hand. You can't really talk about thriving or even incorporate it without um, without doing that. So I would like to get a little bit more information about your good jobs journey. Um, what, what, I guess, what moments made you start really thinking about providing good jobs um, and just, uh, I guess, a high level story time of the before and after of incorporating good job practices into your work. So I started Red Seriously when I was 22 and it was it was a total impulse. Like I literally decided to start a business and then told everyone that I started my business like two hours later. Uh, <laughs> there was no like meditation time. Um, my boyfriend at the time and now husband uh, literally like came home from work and was like, I hear you're starting a business because I had emailed him <laughs> with everybody yeah. else. Um, so that there was not like a big, a big picture at the beginning and i you know i think like a typical young entrepreneur i wanted to do everything myself i wanted to do all the baking and all the mm -hmm. business and then eventually i wanted to do all the baking and hire someone to run the business because i didn't know anything about business and um so there was a lot of personal growth that had to happen <laughs> before I started thinking about good jobs and, and getting beyond that survival mode. Um, so it was actually about 2018. We So seven years into running the business, we had been working with a co-manufacturing company, which means we were outsourcing the production of our product to a third party. Um, and then we stopped that at the end of 2017, brought production back in-house. And so my team kind of exploded like almost literally overnight yeah. <laughs> um, from like six people to 12 and then kept growing from there. Um, and so that's when I realized that like I didn't actually have the leadership and management toolkit that I thought I needed. And in hindsight, mm -hmm. that was very much true. <laughs> Like, and, and it wasn't like an imposter syndrome thing. Like, I don't know what yeah. I'm doing. Like, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. And I recognized that. And then I hired someone to help me. So I hired a leadership and management coach who taught me like the management 101, you know, because I had sort of yeah. figured it out. But I also hired people who were really good at self-managing up until that point so that like they didn't need that much from me. Um and because I started this when I was so young, I had never really had a real job where I had a good manager. So I didn't have like a, someone to draw mm -hmm. lessons from. I'd had plenty of bad managers. So I knew sort of a, a basic list of what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but I didn't have any like role models there. Mm -hmm. So that coaching planted the seed. It got me like the basics. You know, I, I learned like how to have a one-on-one -on -one check in and how to write a performance review and kind of some of the table stakes of like traditional business uh, workplaces. Um, and that got me really interested in leadership. And mm -hmm. so the next year, 2019, I stumbled upon Brene Brown, Dare to Lead. And that was like, phew, that was the catalyst. So yeah. I just took off from there. I was so inspired. Um, and like my brain was just buzzing all the time thinking about leadership and communication skills and team building and company culture. Um, and so we did this like big company culture overhaul and um got really intentional about how we talk to each other and how we communicate and how we work together and collaborate. Um, Cause we had had, you know, some pieces of good jobs. Like we yeah. already had benefits at that point, but we didn't have like the workplace ecosystem that tied it all together. So mm -hmm. there were some of the elements, but not maybe the whole framework that made it a good jobs ecosystem. Um, and so 2019 was the start of that. And we've been working on it ever since. Okay. Yeah, I really, um, like we've chatted a little bit, but I, I really love hearing the entire story. 
Um, and it's kind of funny because when we, whenever we work with other um, small business owners and entrepreneurs at at Prosperity now, a lot of them kind of explain their business growing as sort of like a family, right? Like you have this hope and dream, you made this, you made this decision, but it's not until it expands, right? You talked about your team like doubling almost overnight. It's not until you expand that you're like, oh wow, like <laughs> we actually might have to go to the drawing board. We might actually have to acquire some new skills. So I really appreciate you um, honing in on that. And also um, just kind of highlighting that this was seven years into the game, right? Um, and and we have to like not only normalize, but embrace entrepreneurs as individuals that are kind of like flying this plane while you're building it at the same time. And so just to not be so hard on ourselves, right? When a new resource can enter at any given point in time, that doesn't mean that anything was wrong before then, but um, new skills are always introduced, new opportunities are always introduced into the equation. Um, and so I think it's important that um, you know, we're, we're building a machine and operating it at the same exact time, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, there's no way to learn all this stuff without getting your hands dirty. Like, mm -hmm. I remember I took like a um, intro to business class for women uh, back in 2012 when I was like, this is actually turning into a real thing and I should probably yeah. learn how to run a business. Um, and one of our homework assignments was to sit down and write down all of the problems that we think might come up. And I remember struggling with the exercise. And then a few years in when just like the most random problems come up, I was mm -hmm. reflecting on it and thinking there is no way I could have predicted any of this. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I understand like the basics of the exercise, but so much comes up. So many fires get lit and so many weird opportunities you would never think of happen and weird issues and equipment failures and employee relations issues it's mm -hmm. all gonna happen in real time and you're gonna learn by doing <laughs> so yeah we have absolutely. to be really gentle on ourselves absolutely and i'm glad that you brought up like um i'm glad that you brought up like the challenges hindrances um barriers things of that nature because um as we're doing different landscape analyses across the field across this work um we're hearing this term a lot right? Like pain points, um, talking a little bit about pain points and how those are even different, a little slightly different from challenges or just, you know, problems that we're trying to solve. So um, I would like for you to talk about some common pain points that you come across um, in this uh, world of small business entrepreneurship. Um, and also, um, I want you to kind of talk about them that may, um, that connect to good job practices that may not come to mind for many um, many people that are owning a business and operating one. Absolutely. I love this question so much because um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't get around to working on good jobs because it's not urgent and mm -hmm. it's not on fire. And so many things are urgent and on fire that they take precedent, right? And I want to help reframe that because so many of those things that are on fire are sort of non-obviously linked to job quality practices. Mm -hmm. And so if we could tie those together, it puts a little bit more motivation behind working on good jobs. Um, so if you think of like a business pyramid of needs or something, what you were talking about at the beginning, uh, you know, first we need like cash and then we need to figure out how to deliver our product or service. And maybe at the mm -hmm. tippy top, there's like, someday I'll provide benefits. Um, but then we're too busy to ever get around to benefits or we don't have the profit to get around to benefits because we have high turnover, we have frequent call outs, we have employee mm -hmm. relations issues, we have a gossipy workplace. All of these things that come up and take time and take money and take the business owner's energy and bandwidth and then burn everybody out. And so then you have this burnout culture and it becomes this vicious cycle where, of course, you're never going to be able to provide benefits, right? Because all this other yeah. stuff is happening and taking the forefront. And if we flip that, we have a virtuous cycle where if we're investing in employees and creating job quality improvements and good jobs and an amazing workplace and work-life balance, then employees feel more stable. They're bringing their, you know, 
bringing their best self to the work and um, mm-hmm. bringing their creativity and collaborative energy and innovation. They're noticing, you know, where like things are getting wasted or lost or damaged. They're bringing things up. They're being proactive. That provides, you know, additional bottom line that can then be used to reinvest in the company culture and in the employees. So you get Mm -hmm. this virtuous cycle, um, which I love. And they're kind of two sides of the same coin because it's, it's, like an order of operations thing. And I had to, again, learn that the hard way. We had seven years of the vicious cycle side of it, probably, Mm -hmm. before switching it over. And now, you know, Bread Seriously has super low turnover. We have really high retention rates, long-term employees. I think our longest-term employees are at the seven or eight-year mark now. Um, And that is amazing. We have, you know, employees are referring their network to work for us so we don't have to post jobs very frequently. So hiring isn't a stressor. Um, You know, we have all of our templates and review processes so that there's internal growth pathways so that people have um, some upward mobility in the workplace. All of these things that then go back to reducing turnover Mm -hmm. and increasing retention so that we're not spending that time and effort. So it's hard to have that conversation because um, it's not particularly like bankable, right? You can't go to a bank and say like, well, you know, yes, we're spending 30K on benefits or 100K on benefits or whatever it is, but we're saving all of that money in not having Mm -hmm. to hire and retrain new people that's not as sexy a a financial story as like we're not spending that hundred grand here even if you are spending it other Mm -hmm. places that sort of hide on your profit and loss statement um and so that's where i think it's really important to highlight um like the the way that job quality practices influence everything else about the operation of the business and especially around employees so that you can start reinforcing i mean it's that like triple bottom line mentality, but reinforcing yeah. the importance of that investment. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad that you mentioned the bottom line because it's not, um, it's kind of like reshaping the mind of, of these business leaders, right? To invest in the people and they'll invest in the business. They'll make the business successful. Um, the idea that we are more powerful as a group than as an individual, right? Um, yeah, so I'm really, I'm glad that that you pointed that out. And this um, this question wasn't planned. And I think um, in our interactions, you kind of knew that this was going to happen. Um, but as you were talking about um, leadership, and, I, and I'm going to ask you to put your consultant hat on, right? Because you were talking as a business owner. Now we're, we're putting our consultant hat on, even though I feel like you were wearing both um, <laughs> since the very beginning. But um, I want you to talk a little bit about like... Um, because you were talking about having a hard conversation. And um, as soon as you said that, I was like, well, maybe it's like a hard internal conversation, right? And you talked about leadership development and and um, and changes that you went through, right? Just in terms of your personal development in this line of work. So um, can you talk a little bit about those, I guess that internal conversation that is required of business leaders to um, to optimize their good pro- got their good job mm-hmm. practices. Like, what are the shifts that need to happen um, mm-hmm. internally? So good. <laughs> um, I have so many thoughts on this. So cut me off if I start rambling. But I would say, in terms of like personal growth and personal leadership, there's a whole bunch of work that can be done, and that is. Uh, free if you're brave enough to do it. <laughs> the first thing that I experienced, I it was about three years into running the business, and I had this aha moment one day that um, I didn't need to be the smartest one there. And mm-hmm. that was a really big one. And that was sort of like my first big like leadership moment, I think. Because up until then, I mean, Fred, seriously, it was kind of an ego project, right? I was young. Mm -hmm. It was all about me. I was the face. I was seeing all the customers. It was my recipe. And I was really protective of that. And so I Mm -hmm. was like nervous about hiring people who were, you know, better than me or smarter than me in different areas until one day it just hit me in the face that like, that's what I needed. Mm -hmm. Those are the people I needed to run a successful company. Um, 
and you know now i'm like surrounded by brilliant individuals who are super driven and have different types of creativity than me who can you know we're more than the sum of our parts because of that team building and because of of hiring for that. Um, So I say that's the first one. That is the first way that you might be in your own way of of creating that amazing workplace that you're dreaming of. Um, Another one is just (laughs) self-awareness leadership requires exquisite self-awareness um so i like to coach people through you know looking at their communication style and their management style and their leadership style like and how does that align with their personal values and how do those values align with their business values or if they don't know their personal and business values that's really juicy work to dive into Mm -hmm. um either by yourself with journaling or working one-on-one with a coach or something like that um dare to lead has a great values exercise um that is really challenging but I think very beneficial. Uh, And so there's a lot of just, when you say internal conversation, I don't know if you mean like internal, like me in my brain and in my heart (laughs) or in in my team, but both are relevant. Mm -hmm. So that's the work to do solo or one-on-one with the coach. Um, Internally as a team, it's change is hard. Even change that benefits all of the stakeholders in that change. So in this case, your employees. And it's totally doable and, you know, for for a good cause. Um, So I think those conversations have to be done really intentionally and mindfully, Mm -hmm. including all of the stakeholders in that conversation. So it's not coming in one day and saying, I'm announcing a change. We are going to change our company culture. That is going to be met with a lot of fear and a lot of resistance because Mm -hmm. it's taking the foundation and just shaking it up, right? That's destabilizing. But coming in with a mindset of building together and building collaboratively and and an invitation, I think that's such an important word, is is in that invitation, inviting people into that process of co-creating and co-designing for cultural change because Mm -hmm. that is something that's really, enticing to buy into from an employee standpoint because it is going to improve their stress levels, their work-life balance, their access to benefits, their ability to have a seat at the table, their ability to affect change in the workplace, their ability to take on decision-making power um, or other types of responsibility and ownership of their work. Um, So that is something that is much easier to get behind. And when you can bring the whole team into that conversation, you will design something that works for everybody. And when I say everybody, it's not actually going to work for everybody. Nothing works for everybody. Mm -hmm. But you will, you know, people generally find that if, you know, you will have some turnover around changing your company culture and that turnover is going to be for the best. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely understand what you're saying. And I really appreciate you talking about um, like both sides of those internal conversations, because, um, yes, as an individual, there are certain shifts that you have to make. Um, one of my favorite quotes is you don't get out of life what you want. You get out of life what you are. Right. And so having that real like look in the mirror, examining yourself again, you talk about self-awareness, which is actually a human need. It's something that we all have like some inner desire to do. Right. Um, And so I love that you talk about that. But then again, as we're talking about good job practices and um, and company culture, again, it's not just you. So having if you have those internal conversations with yourself, it's important to have those internal conversations with your team. Right. Because you all are in 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 essence, one sound business body. Right. Um, And so I think you already tipped into um, we talked about company culture a little bit, um, and we we know that good jobs and company culture go hand in hand. Um, and I know that you love the topic of company culture. So I had to ask you, um, what is the importance of having an intentional company culture? Not one that just comes to be, even if it's beautiful, but actually thinking and, and um, modeling your workspace environment and feel after a certain ideal and beliefs. Yeah. Well, I like to tell people that not having a company culture is a company culture. So um, 
everyone has a company culture, whether it's named or not, mm -hmm. whether it's intentional or not. So making the decision to work on it later, that's part of your culture or not even thinking about it yet. That's part of your culture. And I don't, I don't say that in like a punishing or condescending way. Like that is where we all start. That is definitely where mm -hmm. I started. Um, and so it, it takes work to sort of spin up that flywheel of cultural identity, I would say. Um, so where I started was literally working with my coach and just writing it down on a piece of paper, what I wanted the culture to be. And so I chose five tenets of the culture and that was communication, respect, collaboration and teamwork, uh, personal safety and um, food safety. So uh, those were sort of the pillars that I could then introduce to the team and we could talk about, and then we could start doing just some positive reinforcement and recognition when we saw people acting within those tenets. Um, and so then we added that to our hiring and onboarding process and, and you know, revisit it in our annual reviews and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so the importance of having it intentionally created whether it's written down or like institutional knowledge or just something that you are you know owning and and keeping in your head um i think it's important to have some kind of shared set standard so that people know what the goalposts are they know what's mm -hmm. expected of them i talk a lot about setting clear expectations um, in my consulting work and you know on podcasts and things like that um, i'm running a workshop on clear expectations in a couple of weeks i mm -hmm. think it is like one of the best leadership tools that i've come across um, because it defines success and it is a calibration tool to get everybody on that same page. When you know what's expected of you, you can succeed. When you don't know what's expected of you, you can accidentally succeed, yeah. but that's not a comfortable place for anyone to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so when, when you don't know what's expected of you behaviorally, right, it's, it's really icky. <laughs> <laughs> quite the right word for it but Absolutely, like yeah. <laughs> you don't know you know when you're gonna be reprimanded or punished or just shunned out of the in group or anything like that um so it can be a really stressful place to be and and probably not consciously stressful just a little bit of stress all the time that's going to increase that burnout factor for mm -hmm. you and your team so I think that's just one of the reasons that having an intentional culture is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I, um, I, th I thank you for sharing that. Um, I do not even want to like wind down this conversation. I have so many questions just about like bread and, and food and all that good stuff. I might reserve it if we have a little more time um, towards the end, but I do want to just let the audience know like, yes, we brought you here to inspire you, um, to reignite you. Um, to kind of take you on your own personal walk down memory lane of how you started your business and how it's now flourishing and we're looking for tools and resources. Um, so Sadie's also here to talk a little bit about um, the work that she's doing with Pacific Community Ventures. Um, you've referred to it a few times as the best kept secret. So can you just tell us a little bit more? So Pacific Community Ventures is an amazing nonprofit based in Oakland that provides pro bono small business advising to companies across the country and nobody's heard of it and i want to change that because it has been so so helpful for me in my business i started working with pacific community ventures i'll call them pcv from now on i started working with pcv i think in 2012 or 2013 um and i've worked with about 15 pro bono advisors over the last mm -hmm you know, decade plus, um, and on any topic that I needed help with at the time. So my first advisor through them was, uh, well, I signed up for like a sales and marketing advisor, but mm -hmm. turned out what I actually needed was just like a general business advisor. And I was matched up with someone who was amazing. I worked with her one-on-one -on -one for over a year and she just helped me get my um, you know, kind of the business back end set up and my structures and my communication. She helped me you know, make my first hire. Um, 
you know, learned how to write a job description, kind of all these basic fundamental things that I didn't know because I didn't have a role model <laughs> for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've worked with a financial advisor. I've worked with an executive coach. I've worked with a mergers and acquisitions lawyer. I've worked with um, a Google ads specialist. So there are so many super knowledgeable professionals who are volunteering their time to get to work with small businesses because it's meaningful to them or it's exciting to them. Or, you know, the first mm -hmm. advisor I worked with, I got paired up with her because she was opening a company that had a cafe in it and she wanted to work with a food entrepreneur to learn from them as well. So there's this beautiful mutual exchange that happens. And, you know, there are hundreds of people using this service and there should be thousands and tens of thousands because mm -hmm. it is free and it is meaningfully helpful. <laughs> So I've loved working with them and I tell everybody I can about this program. And there's a new program that they're offering that I've been helping them develop, which is called Good Jobs Advising. And so it's specifically working with advisors who have not only experience working with culture building, hiring, HR, departments like that, but also who have some training from PCV about their good jobs tools and how to work with an entrepreneur to help them build their good jobs journey. So it's a really great time to be looking at good jobs because you can get help. There are amazing resources available from the PCV's Good Jobs Toolkit, which is like an encyclopedia of anything you'd ever need to know about benefits, employee engagement, hiring practices to the advising program. And then we also have a program called the community, the Good Jobs Community of Practice. Um, and we are taking applications right now. So this is a 15 month cohort where you will actually get paid by PCV to work on good jobs improvements. So there is a program stipend of $1,650 plus there will be some surveys for you to complete. You get additional funds for completing the surveys. And then you're put into these cohorts where you'll get to build your good jobs network of entrepreneurs. So you'll get to interact with people from different industries and from across the country who are in a similar place as you with wanting to create good jobs improvements. You'll get to learn from each other. You'll get to work with me as the facilitator of those cohorts and with the PCV team. Um, to work on a good jobs improvement in your workplace and get paid while doing it. So it's a fabulous opportunity. It's a pretty low time commitment. It's a 15 month program, but it has just three meetings over those 15 months. So most of the time is for you to implement those good jobs improvements. Um, and it's really fun. <laughs> it's been really amazing to work with all of, the, all of the business owners so far. So I would love to see some folks from this call um, apply to the program. Absolutely. And if you are interested, we will be sending out a mailing to anyone that is registered for this event or um, attended and tuned into the conversation. Um, you could also reach out to us. We have our information and contact information on the next slide. Um, should you want to keep in touch and, and find us on the enters of nets <laughs> um, and figure out how to get connected. And I will kind of thank you so much, Sadie. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I wish it could have been longer. Like I have so many additional questions that we didn't even like, you know, draft up together, but that's okay. I'm sure that we'll be in conversation in the future. Um, and I'm sure that we'll work together to collaborate on this amazing work and this really cool opportunities. Um, so with that being said, I'm actually going to um, turn things over to Joelle to close us out. But um, thank you so much. And you will be getting some information on how to join. And um, we do have a co like a point of contact that you can reach out to as well. Um, that's probably super important. Um, it's displaying now on the screen. So you can either scan the QR code or just um, reach out to Beverly Z over at PCV um, to get involved in this. But thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to interact with you soon and collaborate with you soon. And um, again, thank you so much, Sadie, for joining us for this conversation. Thanks, really Olivia. This was really juicy. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> great. OK, everyone, have a great rest of the day and we'll talk soon. All right. Just thank you again for everybody who attended. 
there are plenty of opportunities to get involved and share the resources that we're creating through this initiative. And we hope that not only will you be a recipient of some of the tools and resources that you get engaged and promote this opportunity as well. But thank you so much for your time today and we hope to see you in the future.